Hey Bronco Nation, I'm Mike Amusio. You might know me from Kelly Blue Book. I also have my own channel where I fly helicopters and we have a Bronco ourselves. I'm a Bronco owner. I'm also a little bit of an audio expert and we're here at B&O. We're gonna talk to some people who actually know about audio. We're gonna talk about the B&O audio system in the Ford Bronco. Let's go. So the first of our experts today, Kyle, last name I can't pronounce, Kyle? Gutowski. Well, that's pretty easy actually, Gutowski. Uh, so Kyle, uh, what is your role here? What do you do at B&O? I am a senior mechanical integration engineer. So one of the things I do is from the early talks to taking the vehicle through development, we are working with the teams at Ford and Harman to deliver the sound system you see in front of you. So you mentioned the early talks. Um, for most people, the audio system is just the thing that's already in the vehicle by the time they get into it, but there's so much work that goes into the audio system beforehand. Um, let's talk about those early days. Like how early did you get involved in the process? So Bronco was special because when we talk normally, uh, most vehicles are kind of a derivative of something else. So you're adapting something, you're tweaking something, um, you're seeing what can be improved. With Bronco, we started fresh. So there wasn't something that we, that Ford had booked already was gonna be in there. So we talked to Ford way earlier than any other vehicle we've done. Um, and what we did was one of the only times that we actually went down into Dearborn and went into a room to look at CAD. So what, one of the things they had us do was take a look at what we have so far. Where can we put something, um, you know, subwoofers, speakers, woofers, stuff like that. What's going to work? What's not going to work? And a lot of the different decisions we made were based on those early discussions with Ford. How early were those discussions? Like how far back are we talking? About? So like March 2017 is my first discussions with Ford. So you got to see the Bronco way before everybody else. Yes, it was very different in March of 2017. Uh, it looked similar to this, but you know, you're just looking at uh, 3D data. So it's not quite the same as seeing it in person, but Early, 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 you know, we knew that Ford was serious about the Bronco and that it was going to be something special. So walk me through those early steps. There you are, 2017. What do you do with that early information? So one of the things we did was we started asking Ford all these questions, you know, well, where's the water going to come to? What kind of uh, debris can we expect? All these different questions that then go to the transducer engineers, other mechanical engineers to figure out, do we have parts that can meet these requirements? Did you have parts that met those requirements? Yeah, yes, we did. Oh, good. Good. Moving to the interior, and by the way, this is one of the beautiful things about a Bronco is you can just take the door off so you have easy access to the interior. Let's talk about things like uh, speaker, speaker placements. Okay, so what, what should we be looking for here? So with the door off, as you can see, we still have a, uh, a lower speaker down here. And this position was kind of crucial into delivering the sound that we wanted to. The area behind the speaker is a, is a sealed volume, and that is good for protection and durability and all the different things that Bronco goes through, the back of that speaker doesn't see dirt and debris to ruin it. The other thing you'll see is up here, the IP speakers, they're tucked up far into this corner, protected from kind of the direct elements. So those are two key points with the placement of the speakers that allow us to still deliver good sound and be protected from the elements. So uh, what if you have the interior where you can like hose it on out and stuff? Um, I mean, is there are there any concerns there? No, there shouldn't be. This speaker here is also robustly water tested. So if you're getting water into the front of the speaker, it should be no problem for the cone on that speaker. Uh, I wouldn't put a power washer into the front of it, but uh, it is robustly water tested. We're back in what I'll call the sub zone. And unless you go ripping plastic apart, you're never gonna see this, but this is the amplifier yes. for a Bronco. I'll let you hold it, cause I don't wanna break it. So this is the amplifier you'd find back attached to the subwoofer behind this panel. You have the subwoofer grill and then attached to that um, over top of the port area and the volume of the sub is an amplifier. The sub in itself was probably one of the biggest challenges for me with this vehicle. So one of the things you have to do is you put in this speaker back here and there's all these other components that are fighting for space. And being a subwoofer, we want lots of it. Mm -hmm. So we have to accommodate all those other modules, still get our space. And by the way, the Bronco has a five door version, a three door version, a hard top and a soft top. And then there's also a customer accessible, remove the soft top or put on the soft top. So all of those things have to be accommodated by our speaker right in this area. 
And, and that was extraordinarily challenging to find the space and to negotiate with all the people at Ford to let us you know, get the volume we needed for performance. Kyle, can I ask you a stupid question? Absolutely. What does an amplifier do? So this is the amp that you find back there. And what it does, it takes all the audio signals from the head unit, from your phone, from the radio, and we mix it to how it's supposed to sound and then amplify it so the speakers can play loud enough for you to hear. So why would that be a step up from like the basic system? Like what does this amplifier give me that the basic so system So this will give you obviously to power all the different speakers we have and, and B&O can put a lot more horsepower into this than you can put in a standard head unit. So explain what a head unit is and also tell me why more power is better. All right, so the head unit that's, you know, by your screen or whatever, that, what that's gonna do is a whole number of things. One of which is send the power to speakers. What we do with this is we have a lot more power so you can play louder, you can play with less distortion, and then on top of that, the smarts of the amp, what it lets Alec do is he has a lot more filters and things to change with the speakers to make them sound how they should sound. So it's not just you got more speakers and you got more power, but there's also a lot of um, kind of tuning that goes into it. Absolutely. Uh, let's go back one thing though. Um, so you mentioned more power, less distortion. Why does more power enable you to have less distortion in the audio? So I guess in simplest terms, the louder you can play without distortion, I mean, if you want it to play louder, that's better, right? You know, louder is what people are gonna want, especially with the top off. Mm -hmm. um, and distortion is gonna be, you want to sound how the sound file you're sending to the speaker sounds. You don't want um, clipping or, I guess, other artifacts to be transmitted or made worse by the amplifier. As long as we're back here, um, one other item that's interesting are these speakers up top here. Actually, yeah, so how many speakers total in the system? So the total speakers is 10, mm -hmm. but you have two in the front. Uh, across the IP, you have some coax speakers, a center channel, subwoofer, and then you have these two mounted on the cross member here. And these are, again, as we talked about, they're up high to get out of the way uh, for the occupants to store things and also for water and the environmental concerns. So there are advantages in terms of robustness in putting them up high. Any advantages in terms of sound and any uh, challenges in putting them there? So advantages as far as sound go, you can see from here, you almost have a straight shot from the speaker to kind of the occupants up front. Usually rear door speakers are a little bit lower. They don't have that same projection towards the front. So when the top comes off, that's great. You actually get better sound from these surround speakers into the front of the car, which is great. You also, another advantage of them being kind of far away and back here is they're not so close to the driver's heads or you know other occupants heads as you would see in other vehicles that have the speakers much closer to your ear. So if they have some distance, it's not as annoying for the rear passengers. Yeah, because I can imagine if you're trying to create a realistic sound stage, that if you have a speaker right next to somebody's head, it makes it impossible. then that's very difficult. But if you've got just a little bit of distance, um, but it's still at head height, then you can um, you know, yeah. move the sound to where it needs to be pretty easily. So yeah, these speakers actually were kind of accomplished a number of goals. Uh, the placement actually worked out really, really well compared to a lot of the other kind of alternatives that you might think of. They're very advantageous. So we talked about the number of speakers and two, well, I guess technically four very important speakers are up here in the front. Let's talk about these guys. So up in the corner, you have coax speakers and coax means coaxial. So you have a tweeter and a mid-range right on top of each other, playing coaxial, uh, bouncing off the glass, getting to the occupant. Well, so that was one of the um, thoughts is like, oh, these speakers are aimed straight up. Is that a problem? Um, is that a problem? So no, I, one of the things that we do early in development when we have you know, the 3D data for everything is we check where is the speaker going to play? Where is the direct sound path going to end up? And Ford will tell us you know, the person will be here. And so we can measure where that reflection angle of sound is going to be, uh, where the cone of influence of the audio will be and make sure that it's capturing the occupant. I don't understand what you mean by cone of influence, but am I in it right now? Yes, the, the cone of influence is the area which the speakers playing its best. Mm. So if you imagine when you're listening to a speaker, if it's not facing you, you don't really hear it that great and it sounds off. As you turn it towards you, it sounds a lot more clear. Okay, and then talk about this guy right here. So that is just a 
center channel, it's not a coaxial speaker. Mm -hmm. And, and that will play the center channel content for your audio, so the, the vocals and stuff like that. Um, and again, we have to make sure that that's bouncing off the glass and getting towards the occupants. Can I ask another one of my stupid questions? So what does a tweeter do versus like a mid-range and a subwoofer? Like what are the different, what are the different jobs that the speakers have? Right, so every speaker has kind of its own job. In the coax speaker, you have a tweeter on top of mid-range. The tweeter provides the high frequency content like cymbals and stuff like that. The mid-range is more of the vocals and you know, the upper range of guitars. And then you have lower woofers and subwoofers for the low frequency content. Yeah, so like the bass and then like the kick. Uh, right. That's where all that, uh, the, the stuff you feel would In come from. In your chest those. would come from the subwoofer. Yeah, so I have the bass audio system. How does this differ from mine? So by upgrading to B&O, you would gain a coaxial speaker here versus what you have. You would add a center channel and obviously the coax on the other side, and then you add a subwoofer. Gotcha. Uh, Kyle, thank you for all of the information about the hardware. And I know something about you. Uh, fun fact, he is a trained listener. I don't know what that means. Yes, I'm a trained listener. So at VNL, it's one of the things we do is we listen to all the cars that we actually make. We're going to talk more about that uh, a little bit later. But coming up next, we're going to talk to Alec, who is the guy who helps guide the tuning. Because it's not just the hardware, but it's what you do with it that really matters.